There's a lot of uncertainty around a lot of things. But amazingly, with all of the fear mongering and everything that's going on, there's not a lot of talk about healthcare. Why do you think that is? <laughs> well, there, there really never is. We, we all kind of come to accept that healthcare has got incredibly expensive, that it's cumbersome, that it's inefficient. And yet we, we have some of the best, we really have some of the best healthcare in the world. Right. Right. People, people will criticize it for other countries, but then they'll come and they'll rent out the whole floor of the Mayo Clinic. Of course. Or come, you know, so, and 30% of my practice is international. Right. And so why is that? Well, because the quality is here, the science is here. Um, but yet how it's delivered is incredibly cumbersome. And the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has really exposed some of the flaws. Right. And these are things that we were talking about before, uh, at least in, 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 in my circle. Right. But now it's just starkly apparent. Now, for someone listening, when you, when you say or orthopedic uh, upper extremities, what, what would that consist of? The hand, the thumb, the wrist, the forearm? Well, all the way to the shoulder. All so, the way to the shoulder. So orthopedics, as you know, is the, is the discipline of, of medicine, uh, medicine and surgery. Okay. We treat a lot non-operative, obviously. So medicine and surgery, that deals with the musculoskeletal system. And that's pretty pretty wide range. For, for my case, I'm an upper limb surgeon, which means from the, from the fingertip all the way up to the clavicle and even the, what we call the brachial plexus, the nerves that come out of the neck. Okay. Once I think it's a neck problem, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I call my buddy who's more expert in that. But other, other than that, I, we do the whole thing. Now, is, is this a very, how relevant is what you do to the grand scheme of things? Well, rel very relevant because in particular, upper limb orthopedics hand surgery is, is incredibly important to society because most of us work with our hands, right? For sure. Uh, yet, you know, we give a lot of attention to, you know, our star athletes and most of them, what they do, they tear their ACL. Yeah, for so sure. So the average person knows a lot about that and they don't know about it's hand injuries. And, you know, exactly. being here in Miami and South Beach, people say, oh, you're a hand surgeon? You know, at a cocktail right. party. What do you do? Make you make you get rid of wrinkles on a hand? Yeah, because they think of they think cosmetic. of everything else. Cosmetic. It, it is amazing. You gotta love Miami. Right? <laughs> For sure. And 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 I go, no, um, I go, you know, I'm the guy you want to call if you're working in your garage with a circular saw and you put mm. your hand into it. Wow. And then right away they 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 wake up. They get they get it. Yeah, yeah. So we it's it's actually an incredibly diverse specialty. Right. Uh, we do everything from congenital, you know, birth deformity, okay, all the way up to arthritis. Uh, trauma, uh, yes, athletic injuries for sure. Right. Uh, you don't want to go to the famous sports medicine doctor because they really do. They know what they do is knee and, and even shoulder, but they don't do hand and wrist right. and much elbow. So uh, it, it is a very diverse specialty, and I was inspired to it because of my grandmother who had rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Really crippling arthritis, and in New Jersey, we went to Columbia Presby. Okay. At the time, I didn't know who the doctor was. Of course, I was eight years old. Right. And I'm sitting there in this office, my feet are dangling, and I looked around and I said, I could do this someday yeah. because I really love my grandmother. Wow. And she, she's an immigrant from uh, Valencia. So when we came from Cuba, she had grown up in, in Spain okay. and she developed rheumatoid arthritis. And then um, little that I know is that 25 years, 30 years after that incident, I would be training with one of that guy's disciples in nice. Pittsburgh. Uh, so yeah, I think that, and I talk about it in, in my book is that that experience really crystallized a decision for me about what I wanted to do. That's amazing, especially for anyone listening out there, even children are listening to that. When you painted that picture at eight and said, look, I can yeah. do this. And look at you now. I mean, you've yeah. built a, I mean, your reach within this field is yeah. so vast. Could you tell them a little bit about that? I mean, you have international yeah. travel connected with this. You built a research. What about your research institute in Miami? Well, what it is is a, I'm a co-founder of a of a cadaver lab, meaning okay. uh, that we you we run courses there. Okay. Because certainly you can read now everything's on the web, but yeah. but it, especially if you're a surgeon, hands on is key. Yeah. And you don't necessarily want to do that first time you've done that technique on on your patient. So <laughs> yeah. You want to sure. do it. So you want to do it with, in a lab that's uh, and it's state of the art. There are a number of these around the country. Uh, ours is I uh, still. I think now is still is the second biggest in the world. Wow! I think the biggest is in Bangkok. Okay. Uh, so there, it, it though these courses go on all the time. Right. Of course, now we're we're struggling as well, and we're doing a virtual yeah. learning uh, right now because that's struggling. But uh, that has allowed me to really meet surgeons from all over the world. Uh, but we do everything there, so right. I don't go that often because I'm only 
you know, I'm a hand guy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm going to ask a very, uh, for me, it's it, it may be a crazy question. Can someone get a general hand injury? Like they, like, like the spine can be, uh, impeded a little yeah. by working at their desks every day and holding their hands the wrong way on the keyboard or not having the right chair. Is there possible to develop some type of issues within that? The simple answer is no. Okay. There, there's a lot of myths about this. Right. Uh, you know, these computer diseases, what happens is there are certain things that are extremely common. Okay. Extremely common general population. And many activities will simply aggravate symptoms. Right. So there's a difference between aggravation and, and causality, right? Okay. And and this is a big challenge I have, and I talk about it in my book, uh, how the, you know, the legal world is seized upon this. Right. Um. You know, I see lots of industrial injuries at work. <laughs> Those guys deserve, you know, not only to be treated, and, but probably a check at the end, right, yeah. for their trouble and, and life changing. Uh, that's not the case with, say, the most common thing any hand surgeon treats is carpal tunnel syndrome. Right. That was around long before Steve Jobs. Understand. Okay, long before. Uh, it's a pinched nerve in the wrist. Right. But certainly if you if you use a keyboard um, and you're holding your wrist in a you know in a flex position for a long period of time. You're putting pressure on a nerve. Got it. And that's called the Phelan's maneuver. Okay. And you're just recreating that. Right. But but of course anything where there's an economic uh, benefit from it may be exploited, and that's Understand. sad. And that that leads uh, to our increased healthcare costs for sure. And that leads to a very very solid point, and that's what I really want to discuss. So the first question I have for you regarding that is one: you've mentioned you wrote a book, and we're going to talk about that. It's, it's in the works now. And that's pretty almost done. Thank it's God. almost done. <laughs> and I, I believe you're you're courageous in a sense for, for touching this topic. But the first question is foolish comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, renegade, huh? Yeah. U.S. health care crisis. Yeah. Are, are, we, are we in your opinion under a U.S. health care crisis? Yes. Are we experiencing? It? Yes. Why? Because we we keep talking about the uninsured and about, it, it, you know, the, the lack of access and inequality to, to health care access and some of the markers show that we we're, we're certainly not where we should be considering right. our expertise and put it as the incredible waste in the system right the bureaucracy has gotten completely out of control and the, the, the problem is the people talking about it if you think about the, the sort of the talking heads yeah. in the media one of the doctors i mean now we're see, we're hearing from sanjay gupta and oh, Fauci man. every day every day every day but you know what those guys haven't <laughs> been in the trenches in a yeah. while uh and I and I really respect. I mean, Fauci. You know, I was at Bellevue during okay. the AIDS scare. I mean, oh, I wow. I would have my hands this far in somebody's abdomen who's HIV positive. Mm. I mean, imagine that. I I did. You know, we didn't know how. And, and fortunately, it's not quite as infectious as 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 we think. And right. even the virus. We but but a guy like Fauci was uh, already uh, at the forefront, mm. and that was a long time a long ago. Long time ago, yeah. So. Um, so the point, the problem is, is that we're not hearing from the people who are really delivering the care. But yet, yet the pandemic is bringing that because all of a sudden we're talking about heroes without oh, without capes. Yeah, we're we're so so. I see an opportunity here, right? Where this unfortunate, uh, sad pandemic from obviously from a, a loss of life, uh, right. but also an economic economic. Yeah, um, I do think that there's going to be something that we're some of us are terming healthcare 3.0. Yeah, where there's going to be a shift in healthcare delivery that'll be a lot more efficient, uh, a lot more outpatient based. Okay, you know hospitals are always scary places. Yeah, I've said this before. COVID, people have heard of MRSA. MRSA is yeah. methicillin resistant Staph aureus. That is a really bad bug. Bad, yeah. Okay, so uh, hospitals have their place, of course. Okay, but we don't need to treat everything there and. The, the problem is you don't hear this on the airwaves. No. You don't hear people talking about this. Yes, now we're starting to see people interviewed or intubating. Right. You know, I mean, to me, they're my heroes. I'm a little guilty. I, I feel like I was an ER doc in Manhattan. Okay. But I haven't done that in 30 years. Right. So I don't have a place being there. The, the people who really deserve the praise are the ones now who are in the trenches. Absolutely. Uh, uh, be, and, and putting their lives at risk. My, my friend's a shoulder surgeon. I, I skied with him. Right when it, all of this was breaking, I was okay. in Italy, so I got out of I got out of <laughs> <Thank> Dodge <God. laughs> just in time from Bergamo. I flew out of Malpensa in in Milan, and he's a shoulder surgeon. He told me last week that 110 physicians have died in Italy alone, That's so directly related to their exposure. directly related. Yeah, yeah. Listen, there's no doubt that it, it, something's going on, right? Some yeah. something serious out there. 
Having said all the things you said, I think it's a valid point to say that a lot of the narrative is being said by the uh, uncaped superhero. I love that you put it like <laughs> that. But what is the real expense of a flawed system? Like what 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 is it? What, what happens to the people if the system remains flawed? Well, it, it's um, it, it, there's a number of things. Uh, one is a waste. Um, I mean, in in writing my book and preparing it, which by the way is more anecdotal than anything, because okay. I think people need to understand what the problem is. Right. I, I wish I was smart enough to write something that had a ton of statistics, and yeah. but I do, I do, you know, um, insert that at times with with sort of real life examples. Perfect. Um, for example, um, there's some studies that have shown that 25 percent of all diagnostic testing is completely unnecessary. Uh, some studies show up almost 50%. Now, maybe not completely, but I'm talking about things that we do to either cover our butts because of malpractice. Right. Because, uh, there are protocols, almost like cookbook. Right. You know, medicine, I, I tell my patients, medicine is often more an art than a science. Yeah. The, the, the gestalt of hearing a patient, how did this happen? When did it happen? You look at their age or demographics. It, you already have a working diagnosis without right. expensive tests. The tests are used to usually confirm, hone in, okay. and these are things that are incredibly costly. But we're being forced into all these, uh, all these maneuvers, right, uh, in order to just get care done. Where and do you think that's yeah. directly related just to dollars? Uh, part of it is that, there, look, there's too many people with their hand in a cookie jar. There you go. And I hate to relate it to something that is the antithesis of healthcare, but it's kind of like the war on drugs. You think, you know, why can't we resolve this problem, right? Well, there's a lot of people, a lot of people. making money from it. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. So what was that? What was that film blow? Was it? Or, yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. So, and unfortunately with healthcare, I mean, there are more than 500 EMRs, electronic medical record systems. Now, you can criticize George W., but he was the one who said, we need to have a national electronic health registry. Right. Okay. That makes sense. But they don't talk to each other. No. They don't. They don't. I just had a patient from, um, I actually operated on a patient. Uh, she's a general surgeon in the Cayman Islands. She's okay. trying to refer a shoulder patient to me and wants to send me the MRIs. I said, we've got the way to do that. Right. But it's called my medical, I'm going to give them a plug, mymedicalimages.com. Okay. Right. These guys, smart guys who said you can send that image through the cloud through the network, yeah. and, and see it. But but when I deal with locally on a healthcare is I don't get that kind of interaction. Right. And and then there's the uh, the, the, the biggest problem, and I, I literally call it in my book, it is a sub uh, section of a chapter that's called authorization is really a four letter word. Oh, there you go. Right. <laughs> because what, think about the concept of authorization. You're adding a whole nother layer yeah. of people to approve something when they don't understand the problem. Yeah. What's the thinking? Oh, unscrupulous doctor may overorder this test. Well, you know what? Weed out the bad doctors. That's true. That's not hard to do. Yeah. The person who orders an MRI or or does surgery on every single person with knee pain, you know that's a problem. Then you then you look at them. Yeah. You know, kind of like we should be doing uh with you know with um uh with screening at, at airports. For sure. Right? Right? For sure. Most oh, no, we, we throw billions of dollars to something where, you know, you don't need to screen my, my they made my 90 year old grandmother yeah. get up out of a wheelchair yeah. and take her shoes off. Yeah. Her feet were 90 years old. You know, does that make sense? And that's what we're doing with healthcare. We're literally, we're literally every step of the way, the insurance companies, are making us, making my staff jump through hoops. Right. So it means that I have 10 employees for a single practitioning hand surgeon, whereas colleagues of mine in Europe might have three or four people. Exactly. So then, then we wonder why per capita, our healthcare is twice as much as Norway, which is, and I've done surgery in Norway. Right. In a little fishing village I've been, uh, and, and, and seen it in excellent level of care. Wow. We just, they just don't have all those. And, and unfortunately, uh, you know, kind of like our fast food, they're also getting bad habits from us. For sure. Uh, Europeans. Uh, a lot of, I talk to my South American colleagues and they're having a lot of the same complaints now. Listen, for, for you to be a doctor and to have your status and to, to have your repertoire of what you've done and to say this, I think it's highly commendable. And I'm sure that's what inspired you to write a book. The name of your book is going to be Healthcare from the Trenches, correct? Right. right. Okay. 
Having said that, and perhaps your book is a part of this solution, how important do you think healthcare education is right now for the average citizen? Vital. And I think that people, for example, Governor Cuomo, tr tremendous job educating people about this. And we need that about all kinds of, of things. Right. We need So, so one of the um, core principles of when we developed Ortho Now, the okay. concept of, of a walk-in orthopedic center, is to educate the patients and the referral sources. Right. Now, understand that some of the primary doctors know about as much about wrist or shoulder pain right. as I do about the eye. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's impossible to know it. Um, and I wrote an article about that for one of the medical journals. It was, it was recently um, uh, printed in a Markets in Insider. Okay. Imagine a financial magazine wrote about wow. this. And I talked about the fact that we have to move towards sort of specialty walk-in clinics. Because there's a huge role for primary care doctors to oversee your health, okay. to manage your chronic disease, Obvi obviously. But the more episodic care should really be done by the right specialist. By the right specialist. You have back pain, don't come to me. Exactly. I mean, yeah, I did a laminectomy when I was a resident, uh, but you know that's not what I do. And right. yet I have a lot of orthopedic expertise. And I still will tell you, I'm not the guy to see for back pain. Wow. So let's let's channel the care the right way. Let's get rid of all the hurdles and obstacles to delivering that care. Right. And we can drop our health care bill 30%. Now, po right. now, politicians, every time you see a new campaign <laughs> or someone running for uh, office, that's at the top of their list, but nothing really ever gets done. Well, well, well look, it, it, it's more, I mean, I, I call out a number of people and look, really smart people. Okay. Right. I mean, Marco Rubio moved his senatorial office, his right. senatorial office across the street from my center. Wow. When he, you know, cut the ribbon, whatever. I, I literally was in surgery. Okay. I told my anesthesia, I said, hold the next case. Don't bring them into the room yet. I want to go. I'm literally across the street. Right. I went there like this and I listened to him and he's a smart, but I have not been able to get to him. Exactly. The last time was when he was speaker of the house and okay. I wrote him a check, a modest check. Right. Uh, to support him in being speaker of the house. He's got the right principles. Right. You've got to speak to the people You've in the trenches. You've got to speak to the people in the trenches. And so I've not been able to get to him. So, so when I hear, I hear the politicians speak. Say, my God, you you you've got to you got to get the people in the room who know how to save, and that is not the insurance executive. No, that no, is no. not the big hospital uh, system. It is really the people who are treating right the patients because we understand what we need, what we don't need, what's superfluous, what's vital, what's efficient, and what's cost effective. Do you feel that a lot of the information is not sourced from people like yourself or similar? It's because you're going to tell the truth. You know, I, I've never, I've never been. You know, there's all these conspiracy yeah. theories with COVID. I'm not like that. I'm, yeah. I, I'm a little bit naive. I'll be honest. Okay. I, I'm a little naive sometimes. I, I honestly think that people ultimately want to do the right thing, right. and and it's a problem I have. <laughs> well, no, they sometimes say we're a mirror. We're we are reflections. So if you're a good person, you assume that everyone's good, right? In so, a sense. so I, I'm not that skeptical to go that far. I, I just think that there are people who are in positions more of power right who um who are the ones who really get the microphone understand uh now you know the internet's been a real level playing field right right but it also it also uh introduces inaccuracies as well right if you look up carpal tunnel syndrome just google that all you're gonna see is kind of legal okay uh, things talking about you know suing your your employer or yeah. your or your keyboard manufacturer uh because they, they they cause this you know common condition for sure and and so it's the right people aren't able uh, to get the message out. Let's talk about facts. I, I was introduced to some facts about what's wrong with the American healthcare. I want to know your opinion, whether you agree with this or not. Americans are overpaying the healthcare. Yes, yes, but but at a, at a big at a macro level. Okay. Not so much a micro level, and I think it's time that the public realizes that just like a lot of other things, it's okay to to pay something for healthcare. Got it. In other words, if you ha if people have a little bit of of skin in the game, some responsibility, they're not going to overutilize. They'll they'll select more carefully. Right. Okay. Uh, the, the person who's uh, hopefully going to write the foreword in my book has written two books about nice. healthcare. Julio Gonzalez. Okay. He is an orthopedic surgeon, a flight surgeon, a military. Wow. An attorney, <laughs> and was the uh, and was the a uh, a Florida a state representative. Very in Tallahassee. nice. He ran, he lost to a trial lawyer. We thought okay. I, I supported him uh, in, in DC. It's a shame he didn't get there. Yeah. But he wrote a book 
uh, called uh, healthcare. Basically, it's like healthcare reform. The truth. Okay. The truth, and he puts it out there. And what? And his new book is basically the, the argument for free market healthcare. Oh wow! Okay. Saying that that there has to be some um, responsibility. And that that people. That's an interesting segue. So, yeah. some say doctors are paid to provide a lot of health care, but not good health care. Some degree, it's we're 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 we've gotten a little too procedure oriented. Um, I think that if you eliminated some of the nonsense we went through and paid us fairly right. for what we did, then that that would diminish. And one point of uh, that and would that be stop adding I have all a the very layers. Successful practice. Yeah. I don't need when I I, I actually enjoy. When I see somebody with shoulder pain and I say, you know what? I'm going to give you a, a, a little injection of, um, of of platelets that are going to activate the healing process for okay. this for this problem and you'll likely get better. And if Got you it. don't, we can always do the arthroscopy later. Mm. Uh, I enjoy that because I'm busy enough in the operating room that I don't need to do things unnecessarily. And any any busy and, and ethical clinician will tell you that. It's the problem is, is that when you, you when my colleague opens up somebody's chest and takes the either a radial artery or to saffron his vein from their leg to put it and sew it into their heart and save their life. And that pays maybe 2100 bucks by Medicare. Right. And includes a 90-day global of following that patient for 90 days, no right. matter how complicated it gets, and making rounds and taking calls at three in the morning. And that pays you 2100 bucks. Right. There's something wrong with the system. The, the, the money is going the wrong place. It's being it, it's it being dissipated. To really what, I, and I talk about in a book, a lot of opportunists, and I don't blame them. That's the definition of an opportunist. The definition, yeah. Is that you, you know, you see an opportunity. Some are ethical, some are not. Right. But the, the point is there's money to be made. And the money really should be made by the people providing the care. So do you think that brings us to my next point? Half of healthcare spending is said to go towards 5% of the population. Handful of patients use the majority of healthcare services while millions go without even barely seeing a doctor. Yeah. Well, there there are um, there's a, a, a section in my book where uh, Dr. Dreyfus, who's a an ER physician, is actually one of the folks who who, who purchased an ortho now center because okay. in his emergency room he saw all these ankle sprains and little wrist fractures waiting for hours. They weren't they weren't at the right place. Right. The, 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 he was addressing the hip fracture. The prisoner had to be in the hospital. So he he saw that a lot of his time was wasted by. So that is recurrent people, what they call doctor shoppers, right? Uh, pe people seeking, uh, uh, you know, narcotic, um, and instead of treating them more efficiently, we we allow this revolving door that that consumes the healthcare resources. Right now, that's also we have to make a hard decision as a as a as a as a people. Right, is should we really spend almost half our healthcare on the last six months of people's lives? Yeah, once the quality of life is eroded. I mean, do we really need to put everybody on a ventilator? Where we, you can see, we had issues getting ventilators right. for younger people who were who were who were getting sick from COVID. Right. And I'm not saying that we're making decisions to play God, but but at some point we have to really really look at it, think about it hard. Um, and I'm you know I'm I'm not the person to do that, but I just want to put that out there to think about it. Healthcare from the trench is the book that you're currently working on. You spoke a little bit about what inspired it, but what can the uh, reader look forward to in that book? Understanding what what the, the people who deliver care uh, go through, the challenges we have, and consequently, that's what makes it so expensive and so onerous to to to, uh, to access. Right. So uh, what they can expect is that the first third of the book, and, and you you touched on this, goes sort of through my journey because right. I want the, the reader to identify a little bit with a, a typical physician. Right. Uh, and and it, it's a long journey. Uh, I, I, no regrets. I would do the same thing all over again. Uh, but it's hard to recommend it to my children with Understand. how it really is. So uh, so the first third goes into my, uh, really from my childhood, all the way through my medical school, residency, uh, hand fellowship training, nice. and, then the, the, and then going into practice, right. which is still part of learning. Very you true. First, going to private practice. You, it's called practice. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so we go through that, and then we get into the second, where we talk about categories of 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 uh, issues that affect okay. healthcare, government, right, insurance companies, big hospitals, and healthcare systems. Uh, we we go into that. Then we we then, then we go into the gets a little ugly. We get into 
the opportunists, uh, the scavengers of healthcare, mm. whether it be the ambulance chasers uh, or um, or the, uh, people who are selling snake oil. There you go. They use, you know, all the time. And then and then we and then we and then the uh, the three hundred pound gorilla, which is malpractice. Oh man, which is malpractice. Which you know, Sweet. every every clinician is under the gun with that really? constantly. There was a study. One came out in 1999 that talked that spoke about maybe close to a hundred thousand people in hospitals die a year due to error. And then several years later, that number was revised to almost a half a million due to error. And that I have a little bit of a problem with that. I, yeah. I've heard that. In fact, uh, one of the experts on this right. um, is actually here in Miami, and in fact, he, he's a patient of mine, and, and he. Um, I don't, he didn't coin the term, I don't think, but patient safety. Right. I don't like it because it makes us feel like patients have to be wary of us. You know, patient safety, it's kind of redu it's redundant. We're here to keep you safe. For sure. It doesn't mean errors on a curve because we're human beings. And yes, we need to design protocols that can minimize that. But part of it is the complexity of healthcare. And I, I'm talking about unnecessary complexity. That that allows those sort of things to happen. If we could focus on what's important, what's cost effective, what's good for the patient, a lot of those errors would be diminished. I am absolutely confident of that. That's incredible. Final words. Where where are we headed? I think we're heading towards a a, a different. We, we're calling it healthcare 3.0. Right. Right. There are there are a number of people out there who um who are talking about this uh very very vocally. Uh, that that there's going to be a reset, and I think it's going you're going to see it in many industries, okay. but obviously healthcare because we it is a viral healthcare yeah, pandemic for sure. Uh, and and I think we're going to see that that outpatient and ambulatory care not only is it more cost effective, but in many uh, cases it, there are less um, risks okay. involved just because you know hospitals obviously have uh, have infectious disease issues right. naturally. Um, Ortho now is is kind of a model for that. Okay. What's interesting is that I, we started this ten years ago, and Ortho now is is simply a walk in center for any orthopedic care. It turns out that seventy percent our our extensive data analytics shows mm. that seventy percent is not even urgent. Wow! It's literally people saying, "Boy, my knee's been hurting me for a while. Yeah, I I can't get an appointment with the orthopedist. I went to the general urgent care and they told me it was a sprain and they gave me some pills. Yeah, and so what happens is people you know they need the right care. So we started this 10 years ago and, and we think that the, the era is, is appropriate for it because we've been around a while and it has been right. very, hard very hard to get the insurance companies to listen, the, uh, the big employers, the ones who pay That's important. for yeah. healthcare, uh, our municipalities. Wow. It, it, it's been a real challenge. We spoke about that even in Miami Beach, Miami to County. Yeah. Uh, even, even in my home city where, where OrthoNow was founded, if a police officer in the city of Doral got hurt tomorrow, I guarantee you he would not be coming to us first. Hmm. That's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah. I have to ask this question. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you kind of look at the good in things and you're not yeah. you know, really into the negative side of things. There's a saying that the med medically – uh, we're going to have a uh, dark winter of some sort that the coronavirus, the COVID-19 will, in a sense, when the cold weather comes, metastasize into something much worse. Do you believe that just as a person? I, I think I'm concerned about the relaxing the distancing a little bit too soon. Right. Um, but, you know, you got to ask Tony Fauci that. They're the <laughs> experts. And, and yeah. it's, it's like that in everything in healthcare. I, I cannot pretend For sure. to have an opinion. I think that that really... Uh, holds a lot of water. Absolutely. Uh, epidemiologists understand this better. Uh, it's funny because I write a little bit about this in my book. So okay. I've studied some of the uh, so the bl the black pa you know the black uh, plague, plague in, yeah. in the 1300s wiped out a third of Europe, 75 to 100 million people. Um, and uh, so we we've been through things like this before. Yeah. We will get through it for sure. Uh, I am an optimist. So good. that that can be you know good and bad, but sometimes it's important to think positive. Absolutely, you have to be, have to be smart about it. Uh, but I do think we have to more critically look at what solutions there are out there. Absolutely, provide care. And you know, a month ago, an article came out where I talked about how providing orthopedic care is going to be a challenge now because if you go to the hospital, 
you may get ill. Right. But but also people who avoid the avoid hospital, it. older people at all costs. What's happening to them it's tough, when yeah. they have an injury? And I, I I have stories for you just from the last few weeks of of people. I did this in an amputation on a lady from a nursing home, who a diabetic who had a uh, osteomyelitis, a bone infection. Okay. That you know, if we caught it early, it would have been different. Right. I mean, she's in her late eighties. It's not the end of the world. Right. Uh, but you know, I I had to do an amputation on her, and that's because these folks are avoiding the hospital. So we have to just have a reset about how we we deliver healthcare. Listen, Dr. Badia, you've been a wealth of knowledge and information. I'm looking forward to your book. I, I love that you touch on this multi-dynamic discussion in the book. Yes. You give a little bit of your story. You're, you've yeah. been in the trenches, and, yeah. and I know we didn't touch on that a lot, but just share really quick before we go, you've done some international work. I think I have saw some stuff in Ghana. Am I correct or incorrect with yeah, that? Yeah, well, one of my hopes, um, one of my hopes going forward, particularly once we find a strategic partner, Okay. Ortho now, because the problem with ortho now is it's been ten years and it right. it, it works very well, right. but in healthcare it's very difficult to grow something big when there's one main clinician behind it For and sure. a good team. So once that happens, then I can focus on my practice, and then I literally want to go probably quarterly and do a mission. I I, I want to give a plug for a group called GCOM. GCOM. So okay. Grupo Internazionale. Chirurgia della Mano is a uh, is a started in Italy and Switzerland, okay. where they do missions, kind of like Operation Smile. Awesome. Uh, and I talk about uh, Bill McGee in my book. I, I had the pleasure of having a beer with him. Nice, wonderful, founded Operation Smile. And I we want we want to do that. Um, and there are groups already doing that in right. hand surgery. So I hope to do that. Yes, I've been to Ghana. Um, I've done this in Guatemala, uh, Bolivia. Right. And I hope to do a lot more of that because that that is really pure medicine. It is. I mean, it's just. The pay, and really, that's what I hope U.S. healthcare comes to. And one yeah. of the reasons I like the international patients, when the patient takes a plane and flies to me from, say, Lima, Peru, or uh, Bridgetown, Barbados, right. with shoulder pain, or it's a really pure transaction. Right. It's, I've got this problem. I don't need, you know, sometimes we have to deal with the international insurance company, but right. there's not a lot of authorization there. Exactly. In other words, I, I want, and they leave. Within days, literally, they leave. They have their procedure. They leave with three days later, right? And they do well. That's and good. And it's it's wonderful to practice medicine unencumbered. Yeah. And that's what I hope that U.S. healthcare can get to. Well, let's see what happens. Yeah. We're all watching the narrative and checking the movie out, and hopefully, the future is optimistic and bright. As I we, so. you know, history shows us we go through things and come out even stronger and oh, better. Sure. So, thank you for all of you listening here. Definitely go look in the links and the notes of this. We'll have contact information for Dr. Badia, some of his uh, projects he's working on, institutions. And we will continue to update this when your book is released. Wonderful. So yeah, if you're expected, listening to this uh, later. June 15th is the sort of proposed date. Amazing. Yeah. So uh, look, Amazon, Amazon, I think, will do will uh, open the pre-order. Okay. I think by Monday or Tuesday. So you'll actually oh, be perfect. able to pre-order it. The Kindle version. Right. And, and yeah. So I'm, I, I'm learning. This is all a new thing. Yeah, I mean, I, man. <laughs> I've written book chapters and scientific articles. This is my first time really writing something major right. uh, to the public uh, that is not about shoulder pain. For sure. Awesome. Thank you for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen, on another episode of Be Inspired. Remember, you can wake up in the morning and make any decision you want, but always know that you have the choice to be inspired. Until next time, I'm Miguel Glover, your host. See you later.